Greetings from Cosmos Foundations. This is Nabila Rahman, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of Cosmos Foundation on the Cosmos Dialogue series on Bangladesh Nordic relations, prognosis for the future. Today, we will commence with opening remarks from Mr. Enayatullah Khan, founder of Cosmos Group, chairman of Cosmos Foundation, who will then hand it over to our chair, Dr. Iftikhar Ahmed Choudhury, President and Distinguished Fellow, Cosmos Foundation, former Bangladesh Foreign Affairs Advisor, to deliver his remarks. The keynote address will be delivered by three keynote speakers. Our Excellency Alexander Berg von Lind, Ambassador of Sweden to Bangladesh, His Excellency Espen Richter Svensson, Ambassador of Norway to Bangladesh, Her Excellency Rini Estra Peterson, Ambassador of Denmark to <coughs> Bangladesh. Additionally, we have our distinguished discussants today who will be joining the webinar as follows. Professor Dr. Imtiaz Ahmed, Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka. Professor Dr. Lailufur Is Yasmin, Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka. Followed by our distinguished discussants, who will each speak for seven to 10 minutes, the closing remarks will be delivered by Mr. Enayatullah Khan. Thank you very much and look forward to the discussions today. Now I would like to hand over the opening remarks to Mr. Enayatullah Khan to commence the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nabila. A very good afternoon. Uh, it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome today the three distinguished ambassadors from Nordic countries, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. The Cosmos Foundation has emerged as an important forum for deliberating on Bangladesh's relations with friendly states. Therefore, our webinar today on Bangladesh-Nordic relations prognosis for partnership is of special significance to us. The five Nordic countries, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden, all recognized Bangladesh on the same day, February 4th, 1972. This early and decisive move to come out and endorse the nascent state spoke to the support for Bangladesh's independence across the region in Northern Europe that these countries occupy. In historic times, the seafaring and adventure-loving Vikings may have never come to the Bay of Bengal. However, in modern times, their progeny, the Scandinavians lost no time in connecting with Bangladesh. Three of those countries soon established bilateral ties and set up their own missions here, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. All three have since maintained a consistency and depth to their engagement with Bangladesh that have made them among our most important and trusted development partners. Over the five decades since this relationship has grown from strength to strength, there's much to celebrate as we observe 50 years of our collaboration. Through that period, Bangladesh has also progressed at a pace that is no less than remarkable. Today, we can take reasonable pride in our GDP of US 465 billion, our growth rate, which is computed at 7.25% at present, is also no mean achievement. But in reaching where we have, we gratefully acknowledge the support of friend, foreign friends like the governments of people of Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. In recent years, the countries have received a lot of attention for pioneering the so-called Nordic model, the social and economic system with certain features set to prevail there. A number of comparative studies of economic and social performance have ranked the Nordics high. Similarly, a number of cross-country comparisons have concluded that the Nordics indeed succeed better than other countries in combining economic efficiency and growth with a peaceful labor market, a fair distribution of income and social cohesion, and the model is often pointed to as a source of inspiration for other people in the search for a better social and economic system. A commitment to international development is also an integral part of the Nordic model itself. It is their approach to development 
as something more holistic than merely aid in the form of grants or ODAs. That has set them apart. The commitment to development index is an annual ranking of the wealthiest nations in the world by how well they, their policies help people in developing countries. The latest edition of the index done by the Center for Global Development sees two of the three Nordic countries occupy the top three spots. In the past, there have been years when they have occupied all three of the top spots. In a statement accompanying this, the index, uh, the GCD states that good development policy is about much more than foreign aid. That's why the index assesses the quality of a country aid in ranking them. That means the aid program's efficiency, transparency, and how well it fosters institutions and reduces the burden on the aid recipient or developing nations is also taken into account. This is where the projects supported by CEDA, Danida, and NORAD are set to have the edge. Those are all aspects of the Nordic approach to international development that anyone in Bangladesh familiar with their work over the years can recognize. And that Nordic commitment and contribution to international development is by no means limited only to Bangladesh. It made perfect sense, therefore, to organize this particular dialogue by gathering all three of the country's ambassadors on the same platform to deliberate on their country's future relations with Bangladesh. We have noted with interest the content of the discussions on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of Bangladesh-Nordic relations. The three ambassadors called on the Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. The assurances of the continuity of close cooperation that emerged from that event were most welcome tidings to our people. For all these reasons that I have described, it gives me immense pleasure to mostly to most warmly welcome to three distinguished envoys of the Nordic states to our event today. Their Excellencies, Ambassadors Winnie Astra Peterson of Denmark, Espen Richter Svensson of Norway, and Alex Bergman Linde of Sweden. We are also delighted that we have today two of the most noted Bangladeshi academics as discussants, Professor Imtiaz Ahmed and Professor Laila for Yasmin. It's my hope that our discussions today will cover a wide gamut of Bangladesh-Nordic relations. I remember uh, last time we had this Bangladesh-Nordic um, uh, dialogue was uh, February 2020, 28 February to be precise, uh, just before the pandemic, uh, and, and, and which was an enormous success. And I think uh, the, the Danish ambassador will, will remember that uh, very nice in-person event that we um, uh, held in 2020, Feb. And we hope that this uh, dialogue will be equally successful. We are very happy that today, Ambassador Tar uh, Iftekar Chaudhry, former foreign affairs advisor, uh, scholar, diplomat, and the president of our Cosmos Foundation uh, will be chairing this event. Uh, over to Dr. Chaudhry. Thank you. Thank you, Anaya, for those remarks and for basically uh, marking out the parameters of our discussion today as well. Uh, I too am delighted to welcome uh, to this webinar the three distinguished ambassadors uh, and uh, also uh, our two sterling uh, diplomats of incredible, uh, uh, who are incredibly qualified. Of course, the brief bios are of all the speakers have been provided, which enables me to cut back on the intros. But suffice for me to say that they have uh, all, they all enjoy an exceedingly high level of recognition uh, for their prodigious qualifications. Uh, the enormous enthusiasm with which the Nordic Week was celebrated recently reflects the warmth of the relationship between the, uh, the Scandinavian countries and Bangladesh, and these which uh, span across a spectrum of activities, social, political, and economic. But the uh, noteworthy feature of each of these has been the emphasis on the human aspects. The direction has always been towards the upliftment of the quality of life and the betterment of living conditions. Those of us who are students of international relations will have observed that in contemporary times of intense realism and self-interest in global politics, the examples of this kind of interactions between 
two states in the, on the, in the international scene uh, is rare. Now, Bangladesh is deeply valued in uh, Nordic countries. This is not only because of the nature of bilateral relations with them, as Anayat has described, uh, though also that, but also because of the perceived role of these countries on the international matrix. The Nordic countries are always seen as a major factor for stability in a sea of global uncertainties. They have acquired a reputation as a force for good with strong moral overtones marked by characteristic human empathy. In my long career in diplomacy in the United Nations in Geneva and New York and, uh, and also in the academia here in Singapore, I have noted the goodwill that nations tend to entertain towards the Nordic countries, whether the issues are focused on climate, or gender, human rights, disarmament, peacekeeping, or development cooperation. Bangladesh and Scandinavia have shared a deep relationship over 50 years, uh, beginning as, uh, and I have said, uh, 4th of February, I think you mentioned, as the date of the recognition of the, uh, uh, by the Scandinavian countries of independent Bangladesh. Now, uh, from the very start, it was my privilege uh, individually, to, personally, to lead the Scandinavian desk in the planning commission. Uh, those days, uh, what we call, call the ERD. ERD was a part of the planning commission. And to work with CEDA, NORAD, DANIDA, and also FINIDA, though, though the Finland was not physically represented in Dhaka. Now, I fondly recall uh, uh, personal relations with such people as Borje Kjongren, uh, uh, of Sweden and uh, uh, Lasse Sam of, uh, of uh, uh, Norway, both of whom uh, rose to prominence in their respective offices and also on the international uh, scene. Now, today, the aspiration for cooperation, which was then a twinkle in our eyes, have found fullest fruition in the manifold cooperation that, uh, uh, that our speakers and also the ambassadors will now speak to. Now, <clears throat> Uh, needless to say that uh, uh, I'm delighted to, to be able to chair this uh, very uh, and conduct this very significant event. As we have dis uh, discussed, we will begin by giving the floor first to the ambassador of, of Sweden and thereafter the ambassadors will speak. And then we will have the discussions, as you have heard, speak for seven to ten minutes max. Uh, uh, yeah. After which, the floor will go back to the ambassadors and uh, I will have each of them make remarks that they would feel would complement what, what, of what is being discussed. So now, so to, uh, to cut to the chase, I'll begin by uh, inviting to the microphone Ambassador Alexandra von Linde of uh, Sweden. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, um, distinguished uh, president and chairman of the Cosmos Group, uh, members, distinguished members of the panel, uh, all of you listening in, uh, salam alaikum and uh, good afternoon to you all. It is our pleasure to attend this seminar to discuss the prognosis for the partnership between Bangladesh and the Nordic countries. We are happy to be back at COSMOS. As you mentioned, Chairman, the Nordic ambassadors did a similar discussion last time in the beginning of 2020. And it is safe to say that the world has really changed since then. Uh, and of course, let me start by saying that this event comes at the perfect timing. As has been mentioned several times, this year is a special year for the Nordic countries and Bangladesh, since we celebrate 50 years of bilateral relations. Uh, indeed, our countries were among the first to recognize Bangladesh as a new independent and sovereign state after following the struggle for freedom by the Bangladeshi people. So on the 4th of February 1972, we marked the start of our long and strong partnership. And since then, the Nordics are proud to have stood by, side by side with our Bangladeshi friends and partners. We see this as a relationship, not only between our countries, but also our people. 
But if you allow me to start in another end, the concept of the Nordics. The cooperation between the Nordic countries, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden is extensive. It, go back, it goes back a long time and is firmly rooted in our shared values and visions. Throughout our history, the Nordic countries have become increasingly integrated and have developed common values, principles, and policies that our societies rest firmly on. We think of ourselves uh, as different, uh, but the value platform is the same. These are based, uh, this platform is based on values such as trust, transparency, accountability, and gender equality. The welfare state, with strong protection to its citizens, is at the very core of what we call the Nordic model. Institutionally, we have set up the Nordic Council, an interparliamentary body of cooperation, and the Nordic Council of Ministers to drive our continued integration. We are already one of the most integrated regions in the world, and we strive to become the world's most integrated region by 2030. The vision was adopted by the Nordic Prime Ministers, and in order to realize this, the Nordic Council of Ministers have named the areas of green, competitive and socially sustainable, sustainable Nordic region as key areas going forward. Given this very integrated approach, it is only natural that the three Nordic ambassadors in Dhaka are delivering a joint speech during this webinar. The integrated approach is something that has been evident, as has been mentioned already, in the celebration of our 50th anniversary with Bangladesh. For us, this is a year-long celebration that started already in February. On the 23rd of March, which internationally is recognized as the Nordic Day, we got the opportunity to jointly meet the Honorable Prime Minister and the Honorable Speaker of Parliament to discuss our partnership past, present, and future. During the spring, we celebrated the broad, deep, and rich relations between our countries through what we called a Nordic Week. Within the framework of this week, we hosted a big business promotion event under the theme of sustainability, with over 200 representatives from Nordic companies and other stakeholders. We did public media outreach, as well as held a recep reception, just to mention a few examples. So this year is an important milestone, no doubt, and it has given us the opportunity to reflect on the partnership between the Nordics and Bangladesh. Over the past five decades, relations have continuously evolved, and we are proud that the Nordic countries have not only witnessed the impressive development journey and economic growth of Bangladesh, but also to the best of our abilities contributed to it. Early on, humanitarian aid was at the core that later moved into a broad development cooperation which has had multifaceted impacts in so many areas since then our relationship have taken us far and we are glad to see our ties transforming with an increasing focus on expanding our commercial ties nordic business have been in bangladesh for decades and have made substantial investments in the country some, like Ramin Phone, H&M and Arla, have gone beyond business purposes and helped empower millions of people. In addition, we also see a clear interest from new companies keen on exploring the potential opportunities of the Bangladesh market. Let me continue uh, by diving a bit more uh, deep on the trade relation aspects between our countries. Needless to say, Bangladesh is continuing to make the case as an attractive business destination for the future. As one of the fastest growing economies in the Asia-Pacific region, Bangladesh's remarkable economic and social progress is nothing short of very impressive. Advancements in economic growth, infrastructure, as well as prominent social indicators such as life expectancy, education and women's participation in the labor force have improved significant, significantly, just to mention a few examples. The Nordic-Bangladesh trade relations have grown steadily over the years. Today, 
More than 100 Nordic companies are doing business in Bangladesh. And we think that all of these companies would agree with us when we say that there is scope for an enhanced trade and business relationship between the Nordics and Bangladesh going forward. Not least when it comes to areas such as sustainability, smart cities, urbanization and digitalization. In light of Bangladesh graduation from LDC status, the Nordic countries in Bangladesh are becoming well positioned to expand their close cooperation. With that said, we also look forward to further dialogue and collaboration with relevant authorities to improve the overall business climate and the ease of doing business in Bangladesh, which still remain a barrier for increasing investment opportunities. The increase in business related exchange open up opens up more opportunities for capacity building and sharing best practices between our countries. It will also result in an even greater focus on the green agenda and combining economic growth with sustainability. At the heart of this lies the Nordic joint focus on the green transition. And let me elaborate a bit more on what we mean with that, since this is an example of an area that we see as a major component of our future partnership with Bangladesh. Sustainability has been a clear overarching priority for the Nordic countries for a long time. Naturally, we have useful experience to share and the Nordics have expertise on how to cultivate economic growth while, sustain, while simultaneously pursuing the reduction of CO2 emissions and energy consumption, as well as the sustainable use of natural resources. Many Bangladeshi companies have more recently initiated this road and the Nordics aim to share the lessons learned of this journey with Bangladesh. The Nordics have ambitious climate goals. For example, Denmark has undertaken to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by at least 70% by 2030, and Norway a reduction of 40%. Sweden's goal is to reduce its emissions to net zero within 25 years, by 2045 at the latest, becoming the first fossil, the first fossil fuel welfare nation to do so. More than three quarters of Nordic electricity is renewably sourced. And we were two years ahead of schedule in meeting our 2020 EU targets for renewable energy. Now, decarbonizing heavy vehicles, aviation and shipping is a key priority. Our government's ambitions are being fully supported by our private sector and civil society. For instance, Danish Maersk shipping commissioned the first vessels to run on green fuel. The Norwegian companies Yara and Kongsberg teamed up to build the world's first autonomous and zero emission container vessel. This vessel named Yara Birkeland was put into commercial operation in Norway in the spring of this year. We believe that together, the Nordic countries can lead when it comes to sustainable transportation. The so-called World Energy Council's Energy Trilemma Index, based on energy security, energy equity, and environmental sustainability, recognizes the Nordic countries as having the highest ability to provide sustainable energy. We are proud to be at the forefront of sustainable technological development, recognizing that the future is fossil free. Investing in innovation and circular business models will create the jobs of the future, as well as strengthen competitiveness. An example of this is, for instance, that Sweden recently delivered the world's first shipment of steel produced without the use of fossil fuels, what is hopefully a major milestone on the road towards cutting carbon emissions from industry. We know that the private sector plays a crucial part in both setting the agenda and offering many interesting solutions that could support in achieving the sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement. We also know that many Nordic companies have adopted clear plans and goals on reducing their climate impact which makes it necessary to reform their global supply chains. 
the possibility is to promote sustainable practices and to reuse, reduce, and recycle a large. The ability to adopt a green business model among suppliers will ultimately be business critical and a major factor for purchasing decisions going forward, and thus a fundamental condition for future access to global markets. There is also an increasing will of the consumers in Nordic countries to make sure that the products they are buying are sustainable and green, not only when it comes to emissions and clean energy, but also the overall environmental impact and carbon footprints. Nordic companies are not only viewed as frontrunners when it comes to sustainability, but also world leaders on innovation. Our companies are recognized for their state-of-the-art business standards, high-quality products, and exceptional service efficiencies. Many Nordic companies are well-placed to provide well-tested cutting-edge green and climate-smart technologies, advanced skills, solutions, and services that Bangladesh will need to continue on its path of sustainable development and economic growth. The Nordic countries look forward to partnering up with Bangladesh on this journey. Let us then uh, mention some bilateral examples of the Nordic countries scaling up partnership with Bangladesh within this area. Both Sweden and Denmark have been pushing the green transition within the RMG sector, both within our trade policy and development cooperation for a long time. The RMG sector in Bangladesh is of high strategic and economic importance for both our countries and Bangladesh in terms of trade, growth, exports and employment opportunities. Many Nordic brands have ambitious climate goals and at the same time there are many Nordic companies that can offer innovative and climate smart solutions and technology to meet these needs. Sweden aims at combining and coordinating these efforts under one umbrella and has therefore launched an initiative that we call uh, the Sustainable Fashion Platform. The platform aims to facilitate both matchmaking between companies to find synergies within the green transition and also conduct policy dialogue with relevant stakeholders to discuss best practices uh, in the RMG uh, sector going forward. With this, Sweden hopes to position itself as a partner to Bangladesh within sustainability and the green transition in the RMG industry, and at the same time continue to strengthen Bangladesh competitiveness in this sector. Sweden's effort on promoting the green transition within the trade policy goes in tandem with our different work streams within development cooperation. In line with the Swedish government's initiative on broader economic relations called STEP, sustainable transition through economic partnership, we aim at finding synergies and links between these two pillars of our foreign policy and make them mutually reinforcing. Our development cooperation covers a wide range of areas and one of our thematic areas is climate, environment and resilience. This includes providing the resources and capacities needed to reduce the impact of climate change on the most vulnerable people, as well as financing and implementing climate adaptation so that people can better assess risks and manage the effect of climate change. Let me mention another example. Um, the governments of Denmark and Bangladesh um, in April and under the auspices of Her Royal Highness Crown Princess Mary of Denmark during her visit to Bangladesh, uh, the two governments signed a, a green and sustainable partnership agreement here in Dhaka. A first of its kind, this has strengthened our focus uh, on green and joint green and sustainable action um, of our governments for the years to come. So this uh, green agreement will apply to all our relations, be it diplomatic, political, commercial and development cooperation. And in addition, uh, Denmark recently took the decision to go from aid to trade over the coming six years. 
This means phasing out development cooperation over the years to come, while we'll be expanding and scaling up the commercial relations. So transfer of knowledge and technology through private sector co collaboration, through joint research, and through peer-to-peer -peer collaboration between the Danish and Bangladeshi public institutions, um, as we are already doing in the area of occupational health and safety, and hope to have shortly also in food safety. Norway, like Bangladesh, is a maritime nation and has built up wide-ranging know-how on energy and marine resources. Together with the IMO, we have entered into an agreement paving the way for Bangladesh to move forward on its path towards becoming a part into the IMO Hong Kong Convention on the safe and en environmental friendly recycling of ships. This work is showing remarkable progress and through the IMO, we will continue to su support the authorities, the industries and other stakeholders in strengthening their efforts to develop Bangladesh's ship recycling industry by the way, which is an industry where Bangladesh is world leader and the country's economy. Ensuring that the oceans are healthy and productive for future generations is high on the agenda, both in Norway and in Bangladesh. In the coming years, the oceans will be even more crucial for global food security, poverty reduction, international transport, and efforts to address climate change and the environment. Norway hopes to work with Bangladesh on the Nordic initiative to establish a global arrangement agreement to combat marine plastic litter and microplastics. For example, a collaboration with the Bangladesh Department of Environment has been initiated to reduce environmental impacts, improve productivity and foster innovation and entrepreneurship through an integrated approach to sustainable plastics use and marine litter prevention. Closing the tap on marine litter is a must do. This is important for all of us. Climate change, multilateralism and gender equality are also important. The green shift will indeed be necessary for our future. As one of the most climate vulnerable nations in the world, Bangladesh has been a global pioneer in managing the risks of natural disasters. The Nordics commend Bangladesh and its tireless efforts to tackle the challenges related to climate change and the environment. We are also proud to have been supporting these response measures, such as cyclone cell shelters and disaster prevention and management in Bangladesh for many decades. Rest assured that we will stay strong in our continued commitment to support Bangladesh in its work towards adapting to climate change. So allow me to take over. The Nordic countries are generous supporters of climate funds. Both the Green Climate Fund, the Adaptation Fund, other multilateral funds through the uh, international financing institutions. And we cooperate with Bangladesh by helping to access these funds. So the Nordics are very pleased to see Bangladesh's updated NDC uh, presented during COP26 and looking forward to participating and pushing the dialogue during the upcoming COP27. The updated NDC shows an increased level of ambition by Bangladesh in meeting the climate action commitments including re reducing the emissions in different sectors and increasing investments in renewable energy, among other measures. Now, pursuing um, ambitious climate action is a question of solidarity with future generations, with, um, with people throughout the world and with our ecological system. Given this, an ambitious climate policy goes hand in hand with welfare, equality, and justice for all. It, the Nordic countries and Bangladesh are signatories to various climate agreements, but cl tackling climate uh, changes 
cannot be done in isolation. It requires partnership, cooperation, and an inclusive approach. We therefore support climate policies that take all people into account and ensures that resources are directed to where they are needed most and that we leave no one behind. Now, the Nordic countries are relatively small countries, but among the keenest supporters of multilateralism, of global solidarity and of international law. We share this ambition with Bangladesh. Defending the rules-based world order is perhaps more important today than ever. Russia's unprovoked military action against Ukraine, which is a blatant violation of one of the most fundamental rules of international law, is a clear proof of that. The Nordic countries will continue their steadfast support of Ukraine in its efforts to defend its sovereignty and independence in so many ways. The Nordics also believe that multilateralism is key in order to jointly tackle the many challenges that we face. We know that Bangladesh shares this perspective and we are glad to see Bangladesh's very active role in the United Nations including uh, its consistent contributions as one of the biggest true contributing nations in the Peace Building Commission, uh, in the chairmanship of the Indian Ocean Dream Association and the Climate Vulnerable Forum. We see great potential for further international cooperation within many of these areas and the UN is a natural arena for that. Turning to the global fight against COVID, it's also part of the Nordic commitment to multilateralism. We all reaffirm our strong commitment to effective and equal global access to COVID-19 vaccines. Global challenges require global solutions. We stand united in our commitment to the ongoing reforms of the international system for pandemic preparedness and response. We have to learn from the past. We cannot wait for the next outbreak to turn into a pandemic before we act again. The Nordic countries also strongly support Bangladesh in its efforts to ensure the basic needs and rights of the Rohingya refugees. In addition to providing humanitarian aid to the refugees since the beginning in 2017, we have extended our diplomatic support for Bangladesh in its effort to ensure a dignified, safe and voluntary repatriation of the Rohingyas to Myanmar when the conditions allow for that. Another important pillar of our partnership going forward is gender equality. We believe that gender equality is a fundamental pillar of an inclusive, sustainable and just society. Because we cannot build societies for the future if half of the population continues to be excluded. So in order to achieve sustainable development, gender sensitive policies and approaches are crucial to facilitate inclusive social development. Women simply need to be involved in the planning and development of policy to ensure that their specific needs are met. Gender equality and women's empowerment is thus an area where the Nordic countries and Bangladesh share a strong commitment and where we have worked together for decades. This includes, and is not limited to, promoting women's and girls' opportunities, both in terms of economic empowerment and access to livelihoods and education. And our joint efforts have, um, have resulted in positive advancements, but more, of course, obviously still needs to be done. We look forward to continuing our cooperation on strengthening women's and girls' rights and addressing social norms 
power structures and the root causes of gender inequality, gender-based violence and discrimination. We welcome the progress and the government of Bangladesh's support uh, of empowering women. It is shown, for example, within the RMG sector in Bangladesh, a sector we know depends on and is driven by the labor of millions of Bangladeshi women who have joined the workforce over the decades. They have contributed greatly to the economic development of Bangladesh. We are also taking note of the active role of the Honorable Prime Minister in encouraging the international community to come together and act as a force for gender equality, which has been uh, expressed in so many fora internationally. It is important to ensure that women's empowerment is on top of everybody's mind, but it is not only a women's issue. We need also to engage boys and men to achieve gender equality. By using and sharing their power and privileges, boys and young men have the ability to shift the dominant norms and ideas about gender and masculinity and challenge the patriarchal beliefs, practices, institutions and structures that drive inequality between men and women. Because we know where, that when women's economic empowerment increases, society as a whole benefits. Distributing resources equally and investing in women's empowerment is now, therefore not only the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do. Respect for democracy and human rights are also key elements of the Nordic common, uh, countries of our common DNA. Our welfare states are built on an inclusive, transparent and equal society with respect for the rule of law and that can provide the opportunity for all to participate in the development of society. We are by no means perfect in this regard, far from it actually, but this is the ambition because we firmly believe that respect for human rights including freedom of uh, expression, freedom of the press, labor rights, as well as a vibrant civil society, creates stability, security, growth, and economic prosperity. And these are actually the backbone of our welfare state. The Nordic countries are following the upcoming elections next year here in Bangladesh and have reiterated the importance of free and fair elections and the ability for the Bangladeshi people to express their views in accordance with the constitution. Supporting civil society organizations that engage in the civic voter education, election observation and the promotion of women candidates would also be actions favoring competitive elections. Now, before I end, uh, as you can hear, we have made a remarkable journey together during these 50 years. Our partnership has been through challenges and successes, and we have stood firmly by Bangladesh's side. It's fair to say that the Nordics want to continue to be trusted partners and friends of Bangladesh. We look forward to a sustainable partnership and friendship for the coming 50 years and beyond. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Does that uh, conclude uh, the Nordic uh, presentation? Thank you so much, Ambassadors. The calibrated manner in which you have sort of very coherently made this presentation in itself is a model, model to emulate, the Nordic model to emulate in a webinar. So this is how webinars ought to be organized. So it was, uh, it, it was extremely seamless the way in, in which you move from uh, the three ambassadors speaking as one as if it were, and yet covering a whole spectrum of, 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 uh, of subjects, subjects that included uh, the need to focus on uh, issues like sustainability, on, 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 uh, uh, on digitalization, 
on urbanization, on smart cities, uh, moving to, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, the, the trade side, where I think uh, a remarkable feature of uh, uh, the Scandinavian participation is the fact that in the 100 companies or so that you mentioned, you see, the, all of these entail uh, technology transfer, which is extremely, extremely important to take us to transition to a tech, a tech economy, uh, to make the green transition, as you say, to the, to the tech economy. You covered social aspects, uh, uh, human rights, the gender balance, and how to cooperate for all of us to cooperate together in order to build a vibrant, pluralist polity uh, at home as well. So thank you so much. I will now recognize our, uh, our uh, distinguished uh, uh, discussants, starting with uh, Professor uh, Imtiaz Ahmed, uh, a very well-known personality in the academia, in the country and abroad, uh, whom I had the privilege of having been not together at the same time, but a decade apart in the same alma mater, the Australian National University. So Imtiaz, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Chaudhary or Iftakar Bhai, as I say. And thank you, uh, the ambassadors, absolutely superb. I think uh, Iftakar Bhai has pointed out, you know, it's almost like a harmony. Um, and I was almost thinking that I'm listening to one person and not three persons. That was the beauty of, of the presentation. Uh, superb on, on, on Bangladesh and Nordic countries. I fondly remember all the three countries. I visited all the three countries. Uh, I've been a very good friend of Ambassador Ragni Birte Loon, mm. and I visited her hometown uh, in, in Vikisong. I've seen the fjord. I visited uh, Uppsala University, uh, going there to uh, speak there. I've also visited uh, uh, Denmark, and I'm uh, family-related. Uh, one of my first cousins is married uh, to a Denmark envoy. So uh, we have a Jamai. Uh, I say we have a Danish <laughs> Jamai in our family. Uh, all the three speakers have been very strong on the issue of environment, and and I understand you know that's been the core of the of the Nordic, Nordic image that we have. And here I think you know uh, since we are familiar with with some of the interesting carbon neutral islands, also you know uh, one can talk about uh, the Bonhomme uh, you know island where you have a carbon neutral place altogether. I was just thinking whether it is possible to replicate something of, of that kind in, in one or two village, just to give a model of, of how uh, one can you know, go for a carbon neutral place. So a, a village uh, or two would actually help uh, if, uh, you know, if, if Nordic countries could uh, think of uh, uh, investing uh, uh, on, on that, and, and that could be, that could be a, a model. Uh, the second issue on the issue of uh, on the Rohingya, uh, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, multilateralism, we talk about bilateral initiative, and of course, we also talk about tripartite initiative, and we have one, you know, the you know, people who talk about China taking initiative, and I was just thinking, you know, Nordic countries are placed, particularly your, you know, your recognition of peace and your agenda on peace is so solid, uh, whether Nordic countries can take a tripartite initiative when it comes to Myanmar, uh, uh, Bangladesh, uh, and the Nordic countries, uh, because that itself uh, will go a long way uh, in, in, in you know, creating a stability here. And also uh, the concept of, you know, uh, Ambassador Linde talked about concept of Nordic. And, you know, when we talk of, of Nordic, we always have peace <laughs> as, as a central uh, element to that. So I was just thinking whether... Uh, the Nordic negotiators could energize themselves. Uh, I know Myanmar could be a, a tough call, uh, but uh, there's no uh, reason why Nordic countries would not get into a tripartite uh, kind of an engagement and, and try to resolve this uh, issue. Now that uh, brings me uh, to uh, one or two, you know, uh, things that I want to raise. Maybe, you know, uh, the ambassadors uh, could respond uh, at the end. Um, you know, the Nordic image that we have somehow during the Ukrainian-Russian conflict, uh, it, it looks to be, you know, uh, getting uh, a little bit messy, you know, uh, with more attention uh, on NATO, more attention on, you know, supporting uh, U.S. Uh, policy uncritically. Uh, that is a disturbing factor uh, for us, for many of us, at least for 
uh, myself as an academician because we always thought Nordic to be very different. Now, when uh, uh, well, Sweden here, you know, is thinking of of joining NATO uh, and not returning to diplomacy or, or not helping uh, diplomacy, you know, even on the Ukrainian-Russia war, uh, you can see it, it's it's Turkey which uh, you know has made some difference to the war with the grain initiative and now with the transfer of uh, prisoners. Well, Saudi Arabia was also there. So I was just thinking what happened to the Nordic countries because, you know, you have a solid uh, kind of uh, foundation uh, when it comes to negotiation. So there, uh, my, you know, my, my question would be uh, whether that is something that you're thinking or will you be just uncritically uh, supporting uh, United States agenda in, in Europe? Because that looks to be quite, uh, you know, uh, the future doesn't look to be quite exciting, given some of the changes in Sweden and also also yesterday in Italy. Uh, one can easily see that people have different understanding of, of, of what NATO should do and where it should go. So I was just thinking, how would you respond to that? My final point would be, it, it looks like, you know, the world is moving toward the multipolar world and there is no way to stop that, you know. Uh, we had, and at, at one stage, we had a unipolar world uh, back uh, during the Pax Britannica, and then it went to bipolar with the uh, United States and Soviet Union. And then with uh, the dismantling the Soviet Union, we had another unipolar. But this is for the first time in the recorded history uh, of the world and of, of human beings uh, that we are entering into a multipolar world. And Europe could be definitely one of the polar. Uh, so I was just thinking, you know, how would, how are you seeing yourself as, as three countries? Uh, you know, although the population, I was looking into the population data, I see that uh, your population is less than the population of Dhaka, uh, you know, collectively, you know, <laughs> Dhaka's, Dhaka's population is 22.4 million and, and all three Nordic countries would be 21.5 million. So I can, I can understand the scale for us, you know, you know, with uh, 170 million people, uh, as a seventh largest country, uh, probably uh, our agenda would be different. But I was just thinking that in the multipolar world that is coming up, uh, how do you frame uh, uh, yourself, uh, your policies, and and the relationship that you will have uh, with other countries in the world? I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Imtiaz. Uh, good remarks. I should think very good. In fact, I mean, the idea of a model village, carbon neutral village, uh, uh, it, 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 taking advantage of this uh, so, uh, the Scandinavian paradigm for uh, carbon neutrality, that is a very good idea. The, okay, I mean, the, uh, the possibility of an intervention, uh, a, a diplomatic intervention in order to ease the, uh, the Rohingya problem and the, uh, and the problems with Myanmar, yes, um, uh, uh, I don't know what the reaction of the governments would be, but uh, even in this region, uh, Norway, for instance, we know that have been, has been active in, in Sri Lanka at one point in time, uh, as we are all, all aware. Uh, uh, so that's one suggestion you make. And the third is a very sort of a, a, an interna I mean, a global international political, uh, political point. I mean, the changes that are coming over in the behavior pattern of, of the Northern European uh, countries. Uh, time was when uh, there used to be someone, you might, some of you may recall, uh, called Erling Björn, who had written on Finland's relationship with, with, with the then Soviet Union. And he had said they follow a pilot fish behavior, which is you tack close to the shark in order to avoid being eaten. You see? So uh, is that coming apart or, 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 or are they definitely taking sides? One question, though, I mean, judging from what uh, Gass has been saying, the Nordic Council. Now, it used to be Council of the Parliament, Parliaments and then the Ministers. Is there, uh, does the council exist at the highest political level of, of heads of government or heads of, or heads of, uh, uh, of state? And how do you actually coordinate decisions on a single political issue? Some of you are European members and, and some are not. So that would be my question. But you might re want to react to that later. For now, uh, uh, Lelifar Yasmin, you have, I think your uh, traffic issues uh, well noted or lack of them in Scandinavia, you can go on to substantive issues now. 
Okay. Uh, so thank you once again for giving me the floor. Uh, SAR has covered uh, most of the areas which I was actually looking forward to so that I don't have to speak much. Uh, but um, uh, thank you for an excellent uh, coordinated presentation on identifying um, how Nordic countries are engaged with Bangladesh and what are the areas that you are, you know, helping, assisting Bangladesh um, uh, in, in, in its path to, uh, in its path to uh, being a, de a developed country. So I would start with uh, one of the issues that was pointed out by one of the Danish ministers who visited um, recently in Bangladesh, um, His Excellency Fleming Moller Mortensen, who um, came here after 39 years. He, he was in Bangladesh 39 years back and after 39 years uh, coming to Bangladesh, he said that what is what a tremendous development Bangladesh has achieved, that 39 year, Bangladesh of 39 years ago and Bangladesh of today is an entirely different entity. So the recognition of these and, and um, this means uh, a lot for Bangladesh because we all know that how Bangladesh started off in 1971 as a sovereign independent country with virtually nothing. You know, businessmen who one needed to import something from outside of Bangladesh, they did not have enough foreign currency to, um, you know, uh, initiate the business. And from there on, where Bangladesh has come today. Um, so one aspect I would uh, like to point out is the uh, institutionalization of relationship among the Nordic countries in one hand and Bangladesh on the other hand. A number of framework of cooperation that has been mentioned by uh, three of the ambassadors here. And um, I would say that um, not only that, but uh, there are certain issue areas that uh, um, uh, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark are working on um, in the areas of uh, blue ocean economy, uh, in the areas of uh, diversification within the RNG, um, in the area of, um, you know, um, uh, in the um, area of uh, assisting uh, uh, governments industries to meet the challenges of uh, meet the challenges that is that are coming from you know other countries for example meeting the carbon um, you know emission goals it has been pointed out also in the areas uh, to fulfill uh, bangladesh's commitment to 2030 agenda for sustainable development especially identified uh, peace building area peacekeeping area uh, fighting against terrorism and violent extremism where uh, norway uh, sweden and denmark collectively are assisting bangladesh um, also uh, uh, how norway has uh, pointed out that it remains committed to the anand commission recommendation when it comes to the rohingya issue um, uh, uh, so uh, in the areas of um, um, uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation environmental damage and loss of biodiversity denmark has particular you know connection with bangladesh uh, at the, the uh, government level um, and also uh, how um, in the in the areas of uh, uh, creating sort of uh, in the in the, in the areas of creating um you know uh, um soft power um, involvement um in the case of bangladesh for example uh, i know that concerts norway is a is an organization which is uh, uh, working with bangladeshi musicians and bangladeshi um you know um, uh, sort of um, the cultural area uh, for um you know uh, regenerating uh, the lost art of bangladesh lost, lost music of bangladesh there has been some smaller areas which may seem like a very small investment for example there has been a paint factory uh, um, which is uh, uh, working with some uh, several million dollars only uh, a Bangladesh chapter of the Norwegian uh, company has now established uh, working here um, so the point of uh, easing of business in Bangladesh this is something that has that is being you know explored and that is being worked here um, as well as we can uh, we can see that um, some of the areas that I would point out for example with Sweden um, the, the trade statistics it does not reflect uh, what is actually happening between because the actual trade is much more higher but it is shown as uh, in lower because of you know uh, it is uh, dependent on in which port the trade items for sweden is being um, you know uh, offloaded so there are certain areas that uh, often are not reflected uh, uh, properly in bangladesh sweden relations that the sweden's um, import from bangladesh is quite higher than is reflected in official trade statistics so um, i would uh, uh, sort of point out a couple of areas for example sarah has pointed out uh, about carbon, um, you know, efficient uh, sort of model uh, villages. So I would point it out uh, to look into that uh, Bay of Bengal hosts the third uh, largest dead zone um, um, where, uh, you know, uh, uh, denutrification is taking place in a, in a quite a high rate. And it is just if you if you go down south, um, it is near to India and, and down uh, south from Bangladesh. So this is the third largest area uh, where ocean is, is, uh, there is uh, this is called oxygen 
chosen minimum zone OMZ uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, something that we need technical assistance from um, you know countries to understand this and so that it does not um, turn into a, a, a sort of a threat for Bangladesh in the Bay of Bengal region um, in the next um, in, in coming years number one number two deep sea fishing uh, something that the entire South Asia re region lacks where there are there is you know um, uh, oceans are losing fish resources especially in North Sea um, uh, around the coast of the Japan and some other areas but in South Asia uh, Bangladesh uh, you know Bangladesh India Sri Lanka and other countries we do not have capacity um, in going for uh, deep sea fishing so this is another area that um, you know uh, uh, Nordic countries who have tremendous expertise uh, they can assist in uh, Bangla uh, they can assist Bangladeshis uh, number three shipbuilding industries here bangladesh and norway are already working uh, but uh, uh, you have seen recently bangladesh has exported its first ocean going vessel to united kingdom so this is one other uh, area that uh, uh, nordic countries can uh, uh, work with bangladesh uh, uh, number 4 uh, i see that uh, the kind of scholarly endeavor that goes on in sweden uh, as sar has uh, mentioned about uppsala uh, the the way uh, the uh, idea of violence the idea of peacekeeping, the idea of peacemaking, these have originated from Sweden and their uh, implication of these and, uh, you know, exchange of academic from Bangladesh uh, to Nordic countries and to learn each other. And uh, one other area I would uh, like, in connection to this, I would like to point out um, that uh, SAR and I, along with some other academics, were uh, uh, invited by one of the embassies here, um, and they sort of uh, wanted us to represent Bangladesh to some other countries. And in my experience, I've, uh, I forgot. Uh, I forgot to mention in the beginning. Not only Denmark, but I also visited uh, Sweden. And there, there is a famous city where you know summer uh, festival, uh, a music festival takes place. I forgot the name of the uh, small town, but it was very interesting. And when I went there, people were looking at me like who is this person where is uh, where is bangladesh and there is very little understanding about bangladesh in in nordic countries so i would like uh, you know you to sort of you know think about this that it is not only uh, you know government to government initiative but how we can uh, sort of uh, create certain kind of visibility of bangladesh because um, we we uh, you know with with my interaction with a number of um, you know um, the scholars number of countries you know policy makers i have seen that what bangladesh lacks is a proper representation of his image in different countries. Uh, so this is something I would like to point out that uh, to promote, uh, you know, Bangladesh's visibility, what, what you can do from here. Um, and then uh, another uh, point of view would be, you know, European Union recently has uh, signed a treaty with the, um, uh, signed a treaty with Vietnam um, in, in, uh, in exporting of uh, technology, uh, in the case of technology transfer, uh, so that Vietnam can meet the challenges of fourth industrial IR, as well as uh, develop its expertise in artificial intelligence so this is something i would uh, you know i would uh, request you to look into so that bangladesh uh, can have uh, this kind of you know technology transfer related agreements with um, with uh, you know european union um, um, uh, as well as with nordic countries because this is the next challenge as uh, um, um, ambassadors have mentioned that um, rmg is a strategic industry of bangladesh this is something that uh, you know 90% of our trade that takes place between eu countries eu dsc countries, uh, DSC countries of OECD. So that is the area we need to develop our expertise and we need technical assistance, we need technological assistance, uh, and we need this kind of particular, you know, um, um, sort of uh, agreements to, to sign. So I would uh, request, um, in, you know, to look into whether there are ample sort of um, sort of areas where uh, Nordic countries can assist Bangladesh in developing, is, um, developing itself uh, to cope with the, you know, upcoming challenges of Port IR and artificial intelligence. Uh, last but not the least, I would like to sort of point out what India sir has pointed out uh, before me, that neutrality in foreign policy is something that has taken Bangladesh this far. Uh, that is, often it is criticized that Bangladesh is not being assertive enough, uh, that Bangladesh needs to, you know, take sides. But I would argue uh, alongside India sir that it is, it is uh, uh, Bangladesh's uh, development has taken place because it has followed a certain path, growth without enmity, that Bangladesh has good relations 
relations with all the countries of the world, it, it might seem that in international relations, how can this be possible? But Bangladesh has so shown that it was a test case of development. Uh, in 1976, the book was published by two eminent uh, scholars of uh, uh, World Bank who argued that if Bangladesh can uh, develop, any countries of the world can develop. Unfortunately, all the other countries of the you know developing countries or uh, least developed countries, they were not able to develop in the scale that Bangladesh has been able to develop. Uh, and therefore, uh, we argue from Bangladesh that it has been possible uh, because of growth without enmity, because Bangladesh has taken a certain, uh, you know, foreign policy posture uh, when its uh, national interest uh, was, uh, uh, came to, uh, uh, you know, um, was, uh, you know, is uh, sort of, its national interest was, uh, uh, you know, important. So Bangladesh has been able to do that. And uh, as uh, you know, some countries of uh, uh, Europe are now planning to join NATO, that tells us that uh, whether, you know, how the future looks like, are we going back in the past or are we actually, you know, because of uh, the upcoming uh, challenges coming from climate change, uh, where as uh, rightfully pointed out, none of us are immune to this, whether we live in Sweden or in Bangladesh. Um, so therefore, and uh, remember that um, uh, the first, uh, you know, environmentally di displaced refugee was uh, you know acknowledged in France that was a Bangladeshi citizen it was it happened in December 2020 because of air pollution level of air pollution one Bangladeshi citizen who was suffering from different diseases uh, she could he did not want to return to Bangladesh and France's court granted him asylum uh, being the first environmentally displaced refugees and more of these cases will emerge if we collectively do not look into this issue instead if we you know uh, sort of transfer our resources from these particular areas to the areas of you know defense and other areas uh, i do not uh, uh, know what will happen collectively to uh, to humanity and especially coming rough, uh, coming back from japan uh, just a couple of days back in fact as you can see a japanese lady is uh, over there uh, in my in my stand um, so i what i've seen that how uh, new generation they are continuously looking at uh, a future where they are more inclined to use public transport instead of purchasing a car they are talking about their individual roles in fighting carbon emission and they are increasingly talking about how to live and let live uh, this has been a fascinating experience for me something that uh, that uh, you know uh, is is happening uh, already in japan and we are need to catch up with that we are need to learn about that um, so i'll finish my talk here i i'm sorry if i've taken much time than i was allotted uh, thank you very much for inviting me in this program Thank you, Lalapur. You made a yeah, series of uh, 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 remarks across a very broad spectrum. You've made good contribution, I think, uh, on, on many, many subjects, very varied, of course. But your idea of beginning with small things, I think, is very well, well, well taken. Uh, I recall once uh, Mrs. Brunfland, uh, she, she'd come to uh, Bangladesh and, and uh, she said, Remarks something similar, similar to that. Uh, she was then, I think, the DG of the WHO uh, at that point in time. Uh, interestingly, like one little historical footnote to, to the RMG industry. Uh, when we were going into RMG uh, in a serious manner, there was actually competition from, from northern, northern Europe and also the south, also Spain and, and Italy. And there needed to be what uh, was called structural adjustment. I mean, the Scandinavian countries needed to go back in it and give us space to develop. Today, today, interestingly, uh, uh, the Nordic countries still remain a bellwether uh, of, for sustainability. The new kind of, of, of manufacture where, you know, a new paradigm of manufacture where you um, make a contribution to promote, uh, promote nature uh, rather than reduce it, you see. So this is one uh, technology uh, that, as you say, through institutionalization of relationships, it may be transferred from, from Scandinavia uh, to Bangladesh. Thank you. All right. So what, what we're going to do now is uh, going to give back uh, to the three in one, <laughs> three ambassadors in one, and allow you to organize yourselves in the way in which you want to react to some of the points made. Some have been on domestic issues, some have been on international issues. Uh, and I, you would like, you wanted to yes. say something? Yeah. Yeah, I, I just like to ask a question. I mean, um, uh, I'll be doing the closing remarks, but, uh, yeah. but very recently uh, in Financial Times, I just uh, read an article, Norway accused of selfish energy plans. <laughs> but 
uh, but definitely energy is going to uh, cause a lot of uh, uh, unhappiness and suffering in Europe, as we can see that uh, the European countries were depending on uh, uh, the Russian gas. But my question to the Norwegian ambassador is that how Europe's energy crisis caused by this uh, Ukraine war is impacting Nordic countries, uh, you know, especially I think uh, uh, Norway is thinking of, uh, uh, you know, like uh, not exporting electricity to the, uh, you know, uh, uh, your neighboring countries there. There are some uh, uh, some uh, dissatisfactions according to the Financial Times, if I miss quote, but uh, but uh, I would like to hear uh, your answer to it. Okay, uh, I suspect there will be more questions uh, even after the the sort of the final remarks that the ambassadors make. So we are looking to a, a, a some kind of a conversation henceforth. But uh, I give the floor back to the ambassadors uh, and and uh, let them react uh, uh, either together or individually to some of the points that were raised here, and then we will open up for questions even more. Thank you. Uh, this this part is not really uh, coordinated uh, only in the way that we uh, agree to play uh, <laughs> as we go. Uh, so let That's me. That's why uh, I said calibrated rather than coordinated. You <laughs> see. Okay, yeah. never mind. Let me start with a couple of the questions, uh, and then my colleagues can chip in. Um, <laughs> and cover some of the others. I would like to, to take uh, Professor Imtiaz Ahmed's uh, questions um, on the Nordic uh, image when it comes to Ukraine, and also where we as Nordics see ourselves in a, a new uh, multipolar world. Um, I think as Nordics, we are very firmly rooted in Europe. Um, Sweden, Denmark, Finland also are members of the EU. Norway, Iceland are not, but with very close ties to the EU, uh, both politically, but also uh, the market. Uh, so in that way, we are very uh, like-minded, strong transatlantic relations to the US. We have been uh, Norway, Denmark, uh, long members of, the, of NATO. Uh, now Sweden and Finland are also seeking to join us on this. And this be is because, in my view, we have a new reality in Europe. We have not had war in Europe for the past, uh, I can't count how many years, since the Second World War. And we have all been very surprised to see uh, war in European territory once again. Uh, and, and frightened. Um, we are also close neighbors to Russia. We are very close friends. The Baltic uh, nations uh, are even closer. Uh, so we feel this very strongly and the, the, the urge to defend ourselves if such as atrocities can happen uh, on the borders of Europe. So I think, as you have also seen in the in the press internationally, move, um, Europe has moved closer together, uh, inside or outside uh, NATO, inside or outside uh, the EU. Uh, so that has really um, made us react um, with shock. Now our international action, you can say, is firmly rooted in on our values, as we also mentioned in our introductory speech. Um, and these values are actually not solely Nordic. They are very much UN values. Um, and UN values are, as you, as you know, uh, values that we share with all the signatory nations to the UN Charter to the human rights, etc. cetera. Um, so, so in that, we call them Nordic values, but indeed they go far beyond. Um, and that is also what is, uh, and, and we take them very seriously. So that is also very much what uh, is at the, at the bottom of our relations to the, the rest of the world. 
uh, I think that will, I'll, I'll end here and invite my colleagues to chip in on this and, and other, and then I can come back at another time. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Sweden, perhaps. Yes, um, I uh, agree with uh, all that uh, Vinny has said uh, on this issue. I think uh, I might want to compliment on that, given that uh, Sweden is one of the two countries in the uh, among the Nordics that have now uh, applied for um, NATO membership. So just to add a bit on that, I think that um, your question, professors, or Professor, of course, suggests a certain manner in which how you perceive the world from Bangladesh. Uh, and as you understand, uh, how we perceive the world from ours is totally different. So I think that for us, there is a clear aggressor here and there is a clear victim. And this uh, narrative that I that I see from here often, that this is a, a wider uh, conflict, that is something that I, I don't, um, we don't see it the same way. There is one aggressor uh, that has blatantly disregarded uh, international law. Uh, it's a nuclear power state. It's a member of the permanent uh, five in the security uh, council that has uh, taken the road from diplomacy and into aggression uh, to invade a much smaller country in the heart of Europe. And this is something that, you know, as neighbors, uh, that you cannot just passively look on at. Um, for us, um, and that's why you have seen Europe as a whole coming together in this very critical moment for us. For us, this has changed the European security order as we know it. Um, we don't share a border with Russia, but Finland does. Um, and we have known uh, our big neighbor uh, for a long time. So therefore, yes, uh, on the 16th of May, uh, the Swedish government took a rather historical decision of applying for the NATO membership. And I say historical because we have been non-military aligned for over uh, for 200 years, uh, which gives you a bit of the kind of perspective that I'm talking about um, and, and how seriously we view this uh, situation. Um, this decision has broad national support. It is firmly anchored within uh, the majority of the parties in the parliament. It has been taken uh, independently, but in tandem with Finland. Uh, and it is firmly based in the belief that we build security to the best together with others. So we see uh, our NATO, this NATO membership as a complement uh, to the membership that we have in EU, to the membership that we have of the in the UN, to our partnerships with the other uh, Nordic Baltic uh, countries. Uh, and as uh, both Denmark and Norway has shown over the years, uh, NATO membership is an addition. It doesn't exclude the fact that we still have uh, are, are based in, in the value platform that we have um, that we have been talking about. Um, so I think that that is how it should be uh, perceived. Um, and I do understand that the world uh, from the Bangladeshi perspective looks different. And therefore, uh, from the Nordic perspective, it is slightly different to given that we have uh, the conflict uh, right at the very heart of Europe. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Of course, I mean, this is a, a, an academic, a basically an academic seminar. So there are times when you speak as ambassador and there are times when you might have to speak as students of international relations. So a question, I mean, uh, uh, we have noticed a broad uh, across party uh, 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 agreement on the way uh, Sweden relates to the rest of the world. Uh, on, on this subject, of course, relations with Russia, there won't be any difference between the previous governments and, and, and the forthcoming uh, uh, one. Do you, 
do people need to watch out for any subtle changes uh, in foreign policy uh, with, the, with the new government? I mean, this is for the first time we see a government of this kind uh, in, in, in Sweden uh, after dec I mean, since the war, perhaps. So uh, do you have any comments to make on this? You needn't. I mean, of course, we don't know what, how, how these will turn out. But just a question that you expect these to be rooted, certainly in the values platform, as you say, but also specifically on other issues, would the foreign policy not change at all? Okay, so just to be uh, um, answer straight back, and uh, then we of course move on to the other issues that that uh, we have been touching upon. So, yes, yeah, so we had an election, of course, as we all know, the 11th of September this year. It was uh, a democratic process, a free and fair, uh, transparent election. It was uh, the result was very very even between the two blocks that we nowadays have in in Swedish uh, politics. Uh, and as can be expected by a democratic press process, um, although the outcome was even the current prime minister, um, a couple of days later when it was uh, when all the votes had been counted, uh, asked to be relieved of her duties. And, um, and was therefore then dismissed by the Speaker of Parliament. But this government, first of all, just to understand where we are in this process, because I think it has consequences for my reply. Um, they, this uh, government for now is a caretaker government. We don't have a new government in place yet. Today, uh, the parliament will open uh, and we will, uh, we will um, elect a new speaker and the current speaker has given after after collaboration and dialogue with all the parties have given um, the moderates um, uh, the assignment to try to form a government so i think for now we have a caretaker government and we don't have a, a new one um, I think that only after we know, uh, after we have voted on the on the new, on the new prime minister and the government that that person will form, and when we know uh, what constellation of parties we have, uh, we then know uh, what course uh, of Sweden will take in both domestic issues and foreign policy issues. I think it is the prerogative, of course, of every new government to shape that direction. And I think that uh, without, um, of course, predicting anything about the future, because uh, as a diplomat, we are now in this situation. So I will refrain to, to speculate uh, uh, or on the future. But if you look back, uh, it hasn't, uh, in terms of the foreign policy, it has been quite... Um, steady throughout the decades. Uh, of course, you have this value platform that we talk about and there is adjustments made, uh, but I think it is the prerogative of the new government to shape um, to shape both foreign policy, of course, and, and domestic policy. And therefore, I think that uh, at this point, we will have to wait and, and, and see. Uh, but that is what, yeah, that's what I can say about that at this thank point. You. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador Richter Svetsen. anything to add? So far, this has been extremely uh, interesting uh, exchange of, uh, of opinions and, and views and uh, uh, a very long list of questions. Um, but before getting to that, I need to grab this opportunity to say what a <clears throat> pleasure it is to again see uh, you, uh, Dr. Chaudhry, whose visit to Norway in November 2007 I had the honor to organize. I was at that time the desk officer for Bangladesh in the MFA Oslo. And uh, I <clears throat> have in front of me here the minutes from your meeting with our then uh, foreign minister, uh, who, is now, who is now our prime minister. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and uh, I must say for the other people uh, in this meeting that uh, you presented some very wise observations and advice and expressed some very 
um, meaningful and good hopes for uh, Bangladesh in the role that you were in at that time. So uh, uh, that was part of my uh, part of the reason why I have become so uh, fascinated and interested in Bangladesh. So it's good to see you again, sir. Um, secondly, um, to comment on a couple of things. Well, uh, just on the Ukraine thing, I mean, Norway has a border with Russia. Uh, Norway has an all-weather relationship with Russia. We have been working closely with Russia uh, always uh, in order to uh, manage, for example, our joint or our common uh, marine resources in the seas between our two countries. We have delimited uh, our uh, sea border in the north. Uh, we have introduced a, a good regime for fish, uh, you know, um, fisheries uh, management. Um, and we have expanded our cooperation into many, many fields. We now see that this, our big neighboring country has invaded one of the, its other uh, neighboring countries. And of course, that is the starting point for how we see it. NATO or no NATO, this is, uh, you know, so it, it, uh, it, it really has had a deep impact uh, on the perceptions of Russia in, in Norway. And uh, I can only uh, sign on to what has been said by Alex and Winnie uh, about the wider perspectives of this. Uh, <coughs> secondly, um, Nordic cooperation. Ah, so Dr. Chaudhary, you, you asked about this, uh, the, the many levels of Nordic cooperation. Uh, and uh, let me assure you that this cooperation takes place on absolutely every level, from uh, you know football clubs in the in any part of the country up to the prime ministers. Uh, so um, it's really, really a close knit um, cooperation. Our prime ministers, our foreign ministers, they meet regularly. Actually, uh, I heard once a Norwegian minister uh, who said that. Uh, after, uh, you know, uh, having been working for a while, he said that, frankly, I don't understand why we have embassies in the Nordic countries. I mean, I'm in contact with my colleagues there every single day. So what do these, what does this, what do these embassies do? What added value do they provide? So, but we still have the embassies. So I, I, I think uh, generally they seem to do a good job. Um. There was some talk about uh, Myanmar, and of course, that is a big concern for all of us. Uh, and uh, regarding the possibility for uh, some kind of a, uh, Nordic initiative for peace, I mean, Norway has been working in peace processes all over the world for uh, many decades. And we have had several successes and some notable failures. But one thing which all of these processes have in common is that we are there at the request of all the parties. And unless you have that foundation, there is nothing we can do. Uh, and I think at the moment uh, there, is, we do, there is no prospect of having such, uh, such a foundation. I can tell you that Norway has been working inside Bang uh, Myanmar for many, many years, and that was uh, before the, um, the changes we saw some years back when Aung San Suu Kyi came to power. <clears throat> so we, we were in Myanmar at that time, and we still have good, uh, good networks there, but uh, situations on the ground and the political reality there now is, is not of a kind that uh, lends itself to any kind of... Uh, uh, initiatives uh, as the one suggested unfortunately because I think we all see the hopelessness of the situation uh, where are the solutions uh, we uh, <coughs> uh, yeah and for Bangladesh of course it's it is uh, a, a tragedy uh, with uh, the huge uh, number of Rohingyas stranded in, in Bangladesh. And maybe, I must also say, maybe even the danger that, that new uh, arrivals will try to make it uh, across the border. 
So uh, we are working with Bangladesh and we are strongly in supporting the, the, uh, the response, the humanitarian response in uh, Bangladesh, as we have been doing uh, since 2017, uh, along with uh, our Nordic, Nord the other Nordic countries and many others, of course. Um, yeah. What else? Uh, there was some talk about mm, <laughs> energy policies in, in Europe. I, it's, a, it's a real problem that, uh, you know, uh, one supplier suddenly uh, is, uh, is, is failing to deliver. Um, and uh, the, uh, the market is currently undergoing a, a very brutal uh, cure uh, to, 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 see, to set up different structures. Norway has uh, much to contribute in this. Uh, we, we are uh, oil and gas exporting nations, especially uh, gas exporting to, to Europe. And we have already uh, tweaked our production so that we have increased our production and deliveries to Europe by, uh, I don't remember the percentage, but at least uh, more than 10% uh, only this year. Um, electricity, the situation is that Norway is a part of a, an electricity and a European uh, cooperation in uh, in electricity. Um, this uh, summer we've had the additional program problem that there has been little rain in Norway, so all our hydropower uh, production uh, has been you know been reduced, and so we have seen energy prices in Norway skyrocket, uh, and that is uh, a big problem for many of the. Uh, people in, especially in southern Norway, where this has been a huge, uh, huge problem, and of course we are discussing uh, how to deal with that. But uh, I believe we are still firm, uh, firmly committed to taking part in the European uh, networks uh, in the in this field. Um, yeah, I don't. Um, but, 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 but. Yeah, and uh, regarding you know the investment climate in in Bangladesh, uh, we we always uh, hear from our Bangladeshi uh, counterparts that uh, would they want to see more investment from our countries uh, to Bangladesh, and uh, I think all three of us always say that so do we. We also want that, uh, but uh, at the same time, of course, we have to realize that uh, investors are very rational people. Uh, who uh, make uh, rational decisions. Uh, they're not afraid to take a risk, but uh, it is not a uh, wild risk. So I think the best uh, way to attract more investment to Bangladesh is for the investors that are already here to show that they are doing very well here. Um, then I believe that uh, more investors will come. But as Lalipur uh, pointed out, a uh, Norwegian uh, paint uh, uh, producer has recently set up a factory just outside uh, uh, Dhaka. So, and we see new companies coming in uh, regularly, although maybe not as many as we would have liked. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for those response, for responses. And also, Ambassador, I want to thank you. 14 years late, perhaps, but thank you for organizing a splendid visit, uh, which it was. Uh, and uh, I had long been an admirer of Jonas story when he was a uh, special assistant to uh, Gro Harlem Br Brundtland. And thereafter, when he was foreign minister those days and became prime minister, a very brave man. I recall an incident in Afghanistan, I think, when he came under attack and a cameraman was, was killed, killed in the process. Anyway, and thank you for the responses and welcome to Dhaka. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm absolutely certain that with your stewardship of Norwegian policies and as a part of the Nordic whole, will develop our, our bilateral relations even, even further. Uh, I, I thought, Kareem Wahid, did you have a question? Are you there, Kareem Wahid? Yes, sir. How are you? Yeah, yeah. Hope you sent well. me a message, I think. You had a question? I did, actually. I had a question for the Danish ambassador. Ambassador, I believe Denmark has become the first country to pledge funds to developing countries specifically for loss and damage. Could you please elaborate on that and how Bangladesh can benefit from that? 
Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for the question that has uh, hit the press over the, the past days. Um, and Denmark recognizes that we cannot ignore the challenges. The extreme weather events this summer uh, are clear testimony to that. So Denmark decided uh, to give a new contribution of uh, 100 million Danish krona to help people uh, in most need through support to climate adaptation and concrete uh, activities to avert, minimize and address cl climate induced loss and damage. Uh, this is not about changing the international discourse on loss and damage. Uh, it's not about legal responsibilities and compensation. And um, we're talking about finding the right means to help the most vulnerable people who suffer most from the consequences of uh, climate change. But, but um, Dr. Lailufad Yasmin also mentioned the visit of our uh, development minister here earlier this year and, and how he saw a very changed Bangladesh. But he actually came to see in the, the first line of defense, so to speak, the people most in need. We traveled uh, both to Cox's Bazaar, but also to Satkira and uh, really to, to those people living with saltwater intrusion, cyclones, um, prawn farms and, and the like. And he, he wanted to do that, to, to start talking about climate loss and damage. Um, we need to, to, be, uh, to open that discussion. It does not mean that that Denmark will lead a new pillar among um, uh, mitigation and adaptation, but it means that we are not afraid to open the discussion on loss and damage, uh, which will be a big one during uh, the upcoming COP27, uh, as we all know, and which needs to be taken. It's been kind of a stalemate between developed and developing countries over the past COPs. Um, so we want to see ourselves as a bridge builder and start opening that dialogue. Thank you very much. And, and you, if, uh, if Bangladesh can access those uh, 100 million uh, Danish krona, um, I think we already are preparing a, a program for our development cooperation in Bangladesh, very much with the focus on adaptation and, and prevention of loss and damage, and also a little bit on mitigation. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, everyone, ambassadors, uh, discussants. This has been an extremely, extremely stimulating, uh, stimulating a, a, a discussion. We have learned a lot, uh, and I thought, uh, I think uh, that when, uh, when uh, the contents of this, these deliberations are known to the rest of our community, I mean, the relations between your countries, uh, the Nordic countries and Bangladesh, would, would even grow e even closer in terms of col collaboration. There is indeed a lot to learn from Scandinavia. I mean, I've, I've been very deeply involved with your part of the world, uh, and uh, I, I really think and I look to, uh, to, uh, to working together in order to do the very same things that I had said initially, that it would, I think, relationship with the Nordic countries would certainly improve the quality of life of each and every Bangladeshi, uh, whether it be governments or, or the civil society, the media, a, a lot to take lessons from. Not everybody is perfect, of course. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, and I had mentioned the Viking times, maybe we are less than perfect during the Viking times, but there was also the Nibelungen saga where, where I, I thought the uh, Nordic role was very positive and, at that point in time. But anyway, thank you so much for the discussions today. Uh, and also because I realized that there was some uh, 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 exchange of, uh, I've, I've seen messages back and forth on, on the schedules, but I think that ambassadors, you have cooperated extremely well with this effort of ours, this modest effort. And thank you so much. 
so much for that. I will now hand over, pass the mic. Uh, the, uh, the deliberations are officially closed, of course, but uh, uh, Mr. Nathullah Khan, the chairman of Cosmos, to uh, give his final concluding remarks. Mr. Khan. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Iftikhar Chaudhary. Uh, you have done an excellent job uh, in chairing and moderating this session. I want to thank uh, the distinguished speakers, uh, all the three ambassadors. I think uh, all of you have done a wonderful uh, job in explaining uh, Bangladesh uh, Nordic uh, ties and the potentials. And also the discussions, uh, Professor Imtiaz and Laila, for both of you uh, have really added uh, uh, so much uh, knowledge into uh, our uh, the potential of uh, uh, untapped potential, I would say. Uh, in fact, after listening to this uh, past two hours of uh, deliberation, I'm very confident that our relations will grow because I see there are a lot of scope for collaboration. And uh, first and foremost is the climate collaboration. And I'm a conservationist and uh, I'm an ocean activist. Uh, I deal with, uh, you know, uh, oceans, Bay of Bengal being the largest, um, you know, bay in the world. Uh, I was just talking to Anna the first secretary from Swedish embassy. And I couldn't bend, uh, stop. I said that I just came from Sundarban. Uh, you know, that was like three, four days ago. And I spent a few days there. And she said, oh, I was there and I saw a tiger. And then she sent me the picture of uh, a tiger. In fact, uh, she was very lucky. And she was, in fact, with our wild team members uh, and uh, uh, that she went. And uh, uh, so there's a huge, uh, I think, scope to collaborate on climate issues, on gender issue, human freedom, media freedom. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks that, that Nordic values are values uh, to be cherished and Bangladesh can learn much from the Nordic experience. Uh, I mean, in, in, you know, in, in tackling and uh, uh, the climate, the, the challenges of climate change. I mean, we are talking about Ukraine conflict and COVID conflict, COVID crisis. But I think the climate change, uh, the devastation and catastrophe that will bring in will be much, much larger than the combined effect of Ukraine uh, conflict and the COVID uh, crisis. So I think there's a huge potential to learn from the Nordic experience and expertise. And, and, I, uh, and I hope that, uh, you know, we will have a follow up uh, in person session. Uh, early next year, uh, you know, Bangladesh uh, uh, Nordic uh, uh, potential, and I hope we'll have a face-to-face, -face and uh, and uh, uh, we would like to publish. In fact, my publishing, uh, the Cosmos Publishing, would like to publish something mm -hmm. between you know uh, uh, Nordic and Bangladesh, uh, uh, you know, uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, I would be very happy if we can bring out something uh, to celebrate our 50 years of our our friendship so let's work on that and uh, and we will uh, we will also celebrate sometime in october uh, uh, we will i will be will be writing to three of you uh, maybe we'll celebrate one evening the nordic bangladesh uh, sort of uh, event where we will celebrate uh, on um, on behalf of the cosmos foundation and by the time our this dialogue that has taken right now, uh, it will be transcribed and it will be getting a very wide publicity across the social media and the mainstream media. And on that note, and also I want to thank uh, 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 our digital team and, and Nahar and Nabila who have worked behind the scene to make this, uh, this uh, webinar uh, a, a grand success. I think it has gone very well. So, and I thank, I thank everybody. And on that yeah. note, I would wish uh, uh, everybody, good luck and good health, and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.